welcome back to the shed. Now I'm sure that regular followers of my channel will be familiar with my little wig wag wobbler engine. So I thought it'd be nice to create a series of videos detailing the steps involved from start to finish to build this simple engine, which is an ideal starting point for the beginner to model engineering. The video series shows the methods I use and to build a nice functional engine as part of an engineering learning process. So to start with, the metal stock needed to build the engine was sawn to size on the bandsaw and then the ends were squared up and brought to drawing dimensions on the milling machine. All of the materials were brought together in readiness to get started on the wigwag engine and in this first video I will concentrate on building the base and attaching it to the main engine column. The base is made from a length of 60mm wide mild steel which has been cut to 80mm long. The drawing stated the thickness to be 20mm but I didn't have any 20mm steel bar in stock so I'm going to use this 16mm which should be just as good. The main column of the engine is made from aluminium and this will sit vertically on the steel base. This is made from 40mm wide stock and has been machined to 130mm long and is 12mm thick. The other stock required to build the engine is a length of 25mm square aluminium bar cut to 60mm long and this will become the cylinder block for the engine. Some 10 by 10 mm steel stock will be used to make the crank connector which connects the piston to the crank via the crank pin. A piece of brass was sawn off at 17 mm thick and this is to make the flywheel from. This has a stock diameter of 3 inches or 75 mm approx and this will be turned down to 69 mm to suit the drawing. Some 40 mm brass stock was sawn off and this will be used to make the crank disc. This, like the flywheel stock, was also cut slightly longer than required to allow for cleaning up of the faces when mounted in the lathe. You will also need some brass bar from which we will make the piston, the spring tensioner and the cylinder top cap. This is 18mm brass stock and we will need about 60mm in total to allow for work holding. A length of phosphor bronze approximately 60 mm long by 13 mm or half an inch will also be used to make the main axle bearings for the engine and also the cylinder pivot bearing to suit the pivot rod. A length of 4 mm silver steel also known as drill rod will be used for the con rod, the pivot rod and the crank pin and this will need to be about 120 mm long. And finally some 6mm silver steel will form the main engine axle and we will need this about 50mm or 2 inches in length. The other parts required are two M5 socket head machine screws which are 20mm long and of course we need our cylinder tensioning spring. The collapsible conical type where possible, purely for appearance, but a normal spring should work just as well. So that's it, all the stock required to get started building the wigwag engine. 
The drawing calls for two counterboard holes to suit the socket head screws to connect the steel base to the main column of the engine, so these were blued up in readiness for marking out. Our first dimension is 35mm from one edge of the steel base, so I set my calipers and scored this dimension on the base. Now I'm probably going to get some stick from some folk for using my calipers as a marking gauge, but this is how I choose to use them, and they are much more accurate than me relying on my eyesight and marking out with a rule and a square. So it's up to you to choose your own methods for marking out. It could of course be done on a surface table with a height gauge, but most beginners don't have these facilities at hand. I need to set out the positions for the screw holes, so I set my calipers to 40mm and made a central reference mark. And then set 10mm from the centre and mark the scribe line. I then retract 20mm back to the second reference line and mark out the positions. Then using my highest power specs I use a fine pointed centre punch to put a tiny indent on the cross marks. I then inspect these positions and adjust the accuracy of the punch marks accordingly by re-striking with the punch on an angle to shift the positions of the centres as required. Once I'm happy with the locations I then open out the punch marks with a bigger centre punch. On the drill press I keep a selection of small drills which I use for starting off holes. This is my preferred method but you could use a standard centre drill if desired. Using the small starter drill I locate the punch marks and then drill down a couple of millimetres into the steel to give the next size drill something to start on. Now the drawing calls for an M5 clearance hole of 5.2mm, but here I'm simply using a 5.5mm drill to open the holes to clearance and give a little bit of leeway when locating the fixing screws. A little bit of cutting fluid is applied to the hole and once the drill has self-centred on the hole I use my table clamp to secure the workpiece to the table. This, combined with the cylindrical stop bar, prevents the work from rotating under drilling pressure and allows me to keep my hands free and safely away from the action. Once the holes are drilled, I need to counterbore a recess for the head of the socket screw. This can be done with a 9mm drill, or you can use a dedicated counterbore tool which will create a flat bottom in the hole to suit the cap screw head. The depth was set and the drill adjusted to a slow speed 
and then the holes were bored to a depth to suit the screw heads and allow them to sit just below the surface of the steel block. The column now needs two corresponding M5 tapped holes for the fixings, so the dimensions were again marked out using the same technique as before, so that the tapped holes will match the holes drilled in the base plate. A quick check was made to ensure the markings were accurate and then, due to the unstable nature of this piece, it was mounted in a machine vise for marking out and drilling. Again, utilising my high powered glasses, I gently centre punch the positions in readiness for taking to the drill press. The holes were started as before using a small drill and then followed up with a 4.2mm drill to suit an M5 tap. The depth on the drawing calls for 15mm so my depth stop was set to this dimension and the holes drilled out. The engine column could now be taken to the bench vise and a small hand countersink tool was used to deburr the top of the holes. An M5 tap was then used to thread the holes to depth using cutting fluid to ensure a clean thread and taking care not to break the tap as it bottoms out in the hole. A follow up with a plug tap was then used to ensure the thread was at full depth. The holes were then blown out to remove any swarf left behind by the tapping.
The base and column could now be test fitted using the M5 cup screws. It was at this point I remembered that my steel base was in fact 4mm shorter than the original spec of the plans, so I had to find some 16mm screws as a replacement. Note to self, don't deviate from the drawings. The error was rectified and the column was fitted to the base successfully and as you can see is already beginning to resemble a nice wobbling wigwag engine. I hope you enjoyed this simple start to building the engine and please join me in part 2 where I will be boring the holes for the bronze bearings and machining out the shape of the column. Hmm, now this structure definitely reminds me of something, but I just can't quite put my finger on it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in part two.